Hello and welcome to the Offsite Construction Series, OffsiteDirt.com um, Construction News. My name is Audrey Grabesic. I am the owner of Modular SureSite. We are a modular um, consulting firm for residential and commercial projects. We also have a dedicated factory line. Um, today brings us to our modular factory owners, um, an in-depth discussion with um, four different owners from Modern Mod, Best Gen, B. Marco and Fading West. My host with me, or co-host, I should say, is Scott Hickens. Hi, Scott. Hey, Audrey. Thanks for having me, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Super excited to get these uh, four representatives of superstar modular factories from across the country here to talk to us today. Um, so without further ado, we're going to introduce the members of our uh, panel today. Our panelists are Anthony uh, Contoris, Chief Executive Officer of B. Marco Structures, Charlie Chuck, Chief Executive Officer of Fading West Development, Michael Heitzman, President of Development of Best Gen Modular, and David Papin, Principal of Modern Mod. And now that you got to see those wonderful faces, we're gonna pass it off to each of them to introduce their company and tell you a little bit about what they do before we go into the questions. So we'll start with uh, David of Modern Mod. Good morning, uh, I'm David Papin, I'm with Modern Mod. Uh, we have a 300,000 square foot facility in Yosho, Missouri. Uh, it's actually our plant two, and we're expanding back into our first plant to a second facility of 146,000 square feet. Um, we, um, we are very uh, probably different than, than most of your modular factories in that we we don't have a sales department. We don't have a marketing department. We we actually build wholesale for uh, brands and we build wholesale for um, uh, different developers, but mostly um, mostly we build for a, a brand as a white label. Uh, we build it, supervise their build and put their, uh, their name on it and build it to their brand standard. So whether it's a hotel or a, you know, an ice cream parlor, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. We build it and to what we build, what they want to build, where they want to build it, and how they want it built. And so, um, and then we uh, modularly move it to where it's going. And so, um, this is a project that we're actually working on with Modular Sure Site uh, in uh, Georgetown, Texas. It's called Finley Oaks, and it's a 29 unit um, multifamily. Um, uh, townhome or condos, I think is what's, what, what it's considered. So uh, we we uh, just, uh, again, we, we build it a brand standard. We work with uh, them. They tell us what they want to do and how they want to do it. And that's 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 how we, we guide our day. Cool. Thank want, you, do... David. And now we have um, Charlie, who will introduce Fading West for us. Good morning, everybody. Um, Fading West really started with the mission of creating attainable housing in Colorado. Um, I'm not a developer. I'm, I'm not a general contractor. I actually have a background in manufacturing and uh, kind of stumbled into this need for attainable housing um, here in the Rockies. We're located in Buena Vista, right in the kind of dead center of the state. And we just saw this huge need for uh, people who really uh, create these towns and create thriving communities. They just couldn't find housing anywhere in the towns that they worked in. So we started Fading West as a figure, to try to figure out attainable housing. And really that started with working with factories in Nebraska and trying to figure out how to integrate um, development with construction, with offsite, um, uh, modular components and bringing that all in as a high quality, architecturally interesting design, but still attainable for someone making between 80 and 150% of the area's uh, median income. So that's kind of our mission statement. And this factory, we decided about two years ago to jump into building our own factory um, for a lot of different reasons. One, we were shipping 500 miles to get into the state and just pretty inefficient. So this factory is gonna be about 110,000 square feet we are 96 days from production start. We've been working on it for about a year now. And we think this factory will put out between 
um, million to 1.2 million square feet of housing a year. We were really aiming at a very, very efficient, very standardized product line, still flexible, but very um, modular Lego block type components. And yeah, so this is who we are and super excited. About half of our production will go to our own developments. This is the, our first development here in View Vista, it's the farm. It actually was kind of testing this idea of how to create tenable housing, but all using offsite production. And this will be sold out, 218 units will be sold out in about five years. So it's just massive need in the Rockies. And this is how we're trying to, trying to, bring, some, um, trying to bring some affordability to, to the state. And it is very needed. Thank you, Charlie, and welcome to the panel. And now we will have Michael tell us a little bit about Best Gen. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm excited to, to hear what the, these other guys have got have going on and uh, tell you a little bit about us. So Best Gen, the company itself started uh, with the idea of, of solving the construction market industry uh, by internalizing as much as we can in, uh, within our own company to do our own development stuff. Real estate development's kind of been a passion of, of Brandon, the, the founder of Best Gen for 25 years. Uh, about 14, 2014, he started uh, to incorporate as much as he can doing his own real estate development and incorporating as much of the, um, you know, the different uh assets to include in the in the process so we incorporated our own architecture firm our own construction company our own modular factory our own um, project management and everything to help facilitate our own development we also do third-party work for other um, companies where we uh, just build the modular factories we do just the design we consult we do construction and it's it's really been an incredible um, incredible experience over the last few years diving into modular and seeing uh, the capabilities of it, what you can do with it, and how you can uh, change the approach from the construction industry side. So there's a project we did uh, over in Colorado. It's a multifamily townhouse product. I think there were, I want to say around 60 units uh, there that we built in our, our factory in Watertown, South Dakota. We have a second smaller factory in Madison, um, South Dakota that builds higher end residential. But uh, this product was uh, designed by a firm in Colorado and built and sent out there. And, and uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful product. Uh, this project is really what got me into the modular industry. Uh, this is assisted living project I designed and built in Kansas City um, for a previous company. The, the product you see here is about 95% modular. The only thing that's not is uh, the two stair towers on the two ends of the building you can't see in this picture. But I like to show this picture because that those corner boxes uh, came from the factory. All those windows were installed, shipped, and not a single piece of glass broke. And building this product really showed the capabilities of modular construction. When you approach it, you have a good factory that knows what they're doing and you have a good team behind you. It, it was really just a fun kind of entry into the modular world. Uh, the next one is a multi, or is this the last one, Scott? Yeah, that was the last one. Oh, okay. Well, then that's it. So Best Gen is, is really just a uh, uh, full service company that uh, can do all or, or parts uh, of your project, um, whatever the need is. Thank you for that, Michael. And last but not least, we'll have Anthony actually share a little bit about B. Marco himself. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And would you mind, Scott, if I kept it uh, this way for a minute before I jumped into the presentation? Yeah. So it's not too confusing. Absolutely. Okay, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And um, I'm excited. Um, B Marco structures, uh, I guess maybe a little different from the stories we heard so far. Um, we started in 2014. Um, and the only thing we knew at the time, there was a lot of things that we didn't know. One thing we knew is that um, construction kind of sucked. And uh, the way we knew that is because the, the person that, that uh, it was me and Boris who started the company and 
Boris built his own soccer stadium in, in 2005 or so in Atlanta. And then he used a precast double T. And so, you know, they broke ground February. They played the first game, uh, soccer game, July. So he's like, oh, my God, this is like amazing. This is offside construction and prefabrication is the future, you know. Then what, what really put the nail in the coffin is when he built his own home in 20, 2012. And so it's like, okay, you know, um, we need to change this. So, so that's literally the only thing we knew. Uh, we started with shipping containers, uh, shipping container modifications in 2014. Uh, didn't have a lot of money, uh, bootstrapped the company. Um, two years later, uh, we get profitable. Uh, we start doing the more fun stuff, doing steel modular for ourselves. Uh, we kept shipping and tenant modifications because because we were pretty good at it and and we liked it so 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 then we go into steel modular for for industrial products um, not so much commercial uh, on the steel front and then finally in 2018 we ran into Marriott in one of the world of modulars uh, modular events and they started talking about this wood modular thing which we had no idea what it was and they're like this and that and we're like okay but still it's better. But that was kind of like I, bu I bias. And then we kind of challenged, challenged our bias. And we started looking into what, what, you know, the commercial wood modular product that, that pretty much everybody else is talking about today. And we're shocked at how strong it is. And then we kept kind of chirping in and, and we were so impressed at just how phenomenally tough that product is. And people were saying, yeah, if it falls off the, the truck, it's going to be intact. And we're like, yeah, you're lying. And then the second person said it, the third person said it, the fourth person said, Anthony, I'm not lying because it happened to me. And I'm like, okay, uh, like we need, we need to, to, to look into, into the wood modular product anyway. And so here we are, we started our second factory. Um, first factory does shipping and tender modifications and steel modular buildings and sorry. And uh, the second factory, which we just started in Greenville, South Carolina um, builds a, a, a commercial wood modular product. So let me let me dive into the the presentation real fast. I won't I won't stay too long on the presentation. Um, and if I could get a heads up that it's showing correctly. Okay. Yes, Thank you're good. You. Thank you. And so you know a, a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about is uh, is is going to be I guess DFMA and a lot of the questions are kind of uh, that that might be coming up have to do with that so you can kind of see how we approach projects um and uh we we kind of fully model um every project and in, in in 3d uh we use revit and we get our shop drawings from that so that's kind of, that's very important to us um this is this is a shot from our factory you can uh see a ceiling assembly uh which you can notice here is uh kind of the amount of prefabrication that we do to the prefabrication, which which is modular construction, so so that's what we believe in, and so you can kind of see how Revit and and design really aids that. So, for example, the ceiling panel that you see here, um, you can see kind of a silver part on the ceiling rim. So so that's um, that's that's a two by eight ceiling rim that that we press together and we feed the ceiling uh, build table with uh, that that length of a rim. So that's prefabricated. The holes. That are, that are used to lift that ceiling panel are pre-done are, are pre um, on the table before that piece is fed to the, to the, to the ceiling table. And then you can kind of see the, the ceiling uh, drywall is mudded and you can see those pipes. Those pipes are uh, fire sprinkler pipes and we pre-test the whole fire sprinkler system before we, we kind of volumetrize the box in our factory. Uh, so prefabrication is very important to us even inside our factory. And this is just some shots. Um, uh, the way that this factory started is a 190 apartment unit project in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, and that kind of gave birth to our Greenville, South Carolina factory. Um, and here you can kind of see that project, that project and you can see on the, the whole bottom is just uh, the first building out of 21. And you can see kind of the, 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 the exterior, the shrink wrap, and then, and then the crane set, of course. And then here you can, and it's my background, actually, this top right picture. It's, it's B. Marco believes in doing just as much as possible in the factory. And that means the LVT, that means the windows, the drywall, the paint, the trim, the base for the shoe malt, the countertops, the sink. So that's what we believe in. 
and those are the projects that we that we want to undertake um and um and here you can kind of see uh, again in that same project in Sparnberg. And uh, I'll close, I'll, I'll kick the share out and I'll close by saying, um, I want to say a bunch of things, but maybe I'll say it later because I can't, I can't think of what I want to say. <laughs> oh my exactly. gosh, that was we so got... entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was awesome, Anthony. That was really great. You know, the, the most wonderful thing about all of the people that are on um, our panel is they're really great humans. And, you know, in a, in a crazy business that we live in, in crazy construction and now offsite construction and learning all these forms, you can see how beautiful um, construction can be, how beautiful these buildings can be, um, how amazingly warm these individuals are and knowing who they are. And I'm sure they probably don't want me to tell you how great they are, but anyway, at least you can see it through their personalities. And Michael, I think it was really important in your rendering that you had the Colorado moose in there because then I was like, okay, I know I'm in Colorado. Yeah, okay. yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that was a fun product. <laughs> Very nice, I love that. So we're gonna go jump into our questions. We're going to ask questions for the next uh, 20, 30 minutes, and then we're gonna leave probably about 10 minutes for question and answer for all of the people that are on this uh, Zoom call today. So I'm gonna open this up and I'm gonna give it to Charlie first. Charlie, why were you interested in building your own factory? Hmm. Yeah, the, um, Anthony kind of said a lot of the great things. Um, I had built a house myself out in Colorado and it was a disaster. Basically, my job was begging subcontractors to show up every day. No quotes, no bidding it out, just please someone come and build my house. And it was incredible. Um, it was an incredible experience, incredibly expensive, very slow, very frustrating. And so as I got into development, I was like, there's no way you can create attainable housing by doing this site built work. So um, we started with this idea of creating attainable housing. We started using factories in Nebraska. And just coming from a background of manufacturing, uh, specifically Toyota production systems and lean, um, there's just so much waste, just massive waste throughout this system. And, and we really think about the entire value stream from you know, entitlements to land planning to, um, to all the infrastructure work, to how to create communities and how do you build relationships within our developments? And then how do you integrate offsite with all of the construction activities that happen and then how do you get people into a house that they, they love living in? Um, and so as we looked at it and we kind of stumbled into this massive demand and specifically in Colorado, and it's really across this, the United States, but um, we got interested in it because we thought we could bring all of that to Colorado and do it differently and integrate it across the entire value stream and super excited about being able to control all aspects of that from cost and architecture and livability and quality and all those fun things. Love it. Uh, Michael, we ask you the same question. Why were you interested in building your own factory? Uh, a lot of the same reasons, you know, Charlie just talked about, um, you know, when you're, you're in the construction industry and you, you build a commercial or a residential product and you see all the, um, all the issues, all the things that are just such time suckers that just take so much time and cause such a headache. Um, being able to minimize that and control so much ahead of time. It, it's just, it, it was great. Um, the experience I had even with modular the first time I was approaching it from an architect standpoint. And uh, I saw even at that standpoint by building a modular fact or a modular product and a site build product at the same time, the, the disconnect and communication between the two that I saw that you could actually solve within the modular industry and actually create that much more synergy with it. It really just uh, spearheaded that whole concept and idea to really dive deep and and go all in and figure out, okay, if we're going to do modular, let's, let's figure out the best way to do it across the board. So not just from the factory building construction standpoint, but the site built, the design, the development, uh, the financing all the way through. And so that's where we started. And, and um, if a project's done right and you have the right people on the team, it's just a, a, a beautiful process and it's really cool to watch. 
I so agree with you. Um, David, why were you interested? I think this is like your third factory you've built, correct? I, I, um, I'm going to show my age here. Uh, so I've been interested in, in owning my own factory ever since I saw us steel, uh, work on Disney world in, in the seventies. Um, they had it, they had it down then way long before we, we got the rights to do it. And I just got, uh, honestly working in the commercial world with Hilton and different companies and building, uh, hotels as a, as a GC and hotels as a, uh, as a, as a commercial builder and, and different projects, I got, uh, really sick of being told no. I got really sick of being, uh, dealt with, uh, dealing with, uh, the time limits. So slow, you know, limited build seasons and, and, uh, this and that and the other. And I realized that, that at the same time that, that, you would typically put up an infrastructure for a building. You could be building that same building in, in a controlled environment. And, and I've always been kind of a uh, solutions guy. And so we took it to uh, multiple different layers of, of things that we provide for our brands and for our customers so that we can, we can, we can service their needs exactly to, uh, to what they'd been told no for and why they couldn't do it and how they couldn't save money or save time. And, uh, you know, we do a, a, a products that, that not a lot of people in the industry do. And so it's, um, it's, it was mainly, uh, to, to be a solutions guy. I wanted to solve the problems for myself. And it turned out that those same problems that I was having, uh, a lot of other people had as well. So, uh, building my own factory was was just a uh, means to an end. I love it, David. That was awesome. And Anthony, we're going to have you close it out. We kind of heard a little bit of your background, but if there is any other insight as to how things are expanding for you, I know this is your this is your second factory, going from steel now into wood. Um, I love I love where your 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 direction's going. Yeah, thank you. And and really, um, I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, we were sitting sitting down and we're like, okay, uh, we want to first prove the demand of the market before we go and spend a lot of money on a factory. You know, Charlie is is working on his own development as well, which can be part of part of what he's going to be building. And at the time, uh, well, we didn't have that, so essentially we were looking for about a year for a project, and then we actually got the contract first and signed it and then got into the factory and of course that was that was very difficult to do but we did it um but yeah so so we're in the midst of building this one project and and we're working on 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 kind of future projects to to move forward from there but uh yeah it, it doesn't uh interesting fact uh since you asked me is um, a steel modular factory, and especially the way we're running the one in Atlanta that we have, is very, very different from a wood modular factory. And I guess you already have a question about that, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about that. Um, but wait, I'm doing a really good job if you didn't want people to know that, <laughs> that you gave us the questions. And, and oh, we were thanks prepared. for sneaking that in. <laughs> yeah, we're going to ask that next. <laughs> so uh, I'm sorry, I'll answer this question. Uh, I have a feeling you'll answer. You'll you'll ask the the other question. Um, um, I guess uh, why were we interested in building our own factory? Um, I, I'm afraid this question, the answer to that question, would differ depending on when you asked us. When we started the company, we could just very clearly see that as kind of the way to affect and change the construction industry is to just just go into offsite ourselves and be a manufacturer. That by no means is that the only way to to kind of uh, change the way construction is done. That's the one way that we saw. Um, now, in the past couple of, um, of of months and maybe a year, I would say uh, we are kind of um, talking a lot about our own development. So that's a whole different answer, and that answer would resemble uh, Michael's and Charlie's answer a lot. So I wouldn't bore you with it. But yeah, along the years, that kind of uh, the answer to that question has evolved, um, but but it's always been a yes. We're we're interested. Well, thank you for all those answers, gentlemen. So I'll be hopping in to ask you the second question. 
as we get into the talk about manufacturing, design, and plant processes for modular construction. So obviously, when they're running homes through factories, they need to be designed in a way where they can be built in a factory. Anthony mentioned uh, design for manufacturing assembly before. Um, but we'll start with uh, you, Michael. Uh, what trends do you see in manufacturing, design, and plant processes for modular construction? Oh, man. Um... Well, it's, uh, I think a big one that we really stepped into ourselves is really when you talk about the design, um, I ran into this myself when I first got into the industry. I, you know, I didn't know, being the architect, I didn't know how to design a modular product. It sounds simple. You just line up some walls and go, but there's a lot more to it than that. So I think one of the big trends is the, the designers, the architects, the factories, the GCs are going to start to establish and, and have better communication early on um, to talk about the process and the project as a whole. So, you know, Anthony mentioned he wants to build as much as possible in the, in the box as he's building this thing, because the more you can do in the factory, the more time it saves you on site. And I think you'll see manufacturers saying, okay, well, this is how we used to build, but now we want to build what makes sense for the project. Do we want to incorporate parapets that tilt up? Do we want to uh, panelize some of the walls versus modularize all of it? Or can we, you know, do different things um, above and beyond what we used to do? So instead of saying, okay, this is my box, you know, owner, contract, architect, you, you take this and, and uh, finish the project, it's going to be, well, okay, here's my box, but here's your project. Let's see what I can do to adjust this or, or build it or design it differently to better fit the process. I think that's a big piece that's, uh, I think factories are starting to open, open their, um, uh, their process up to. And I think more designers are getting to know factories early on to really think about that design concept. Uh, the other piece I think is incorporating the steel. Um, I know metal prices are up like crazy and wood prices are starting to come back down. We'll see how far they go. Uh, but being able to utilize both, we're, we're getting ready to start a plant down in the Southwest and that plant will pr produce both metal and wood modular process or projects as well. Um, so incorporating the two both in the same box and in separate boxes, I think will be a, a huge piece. We'll, and just, you know, thinking what all you can do with a box, you, miss, you mentioned, Audrey, there, uh, people think of modular as these square boxes that it's, you know, there's no aesthetic to it, no design to it. But um, as you've seen with several, several of the projects, these, everyone's presented, there's a, a beauty to them. And you can, if you really dig into it, you can do a lot with modular construction. Indeed, you can. And we're trying to break that stereotype that it just has to be a boring, simple box. And we're doing that by having you gentlemen discuss this today. So I'll pass it off second to, to Anthony. You mentioned DFMA. Do you want to maybe educate us on some of those processes and, and buzzwords that you're seeing in modular? Yeah, so if I didn't mention what it stands for, I'm sorry. Uh, so DFMA, Design for Manufacturing. And um, I think that I want to take a moment and talk about not just the good, but maybe the bad. And maybe I'm going to get some heat on this after that. I'm glad we didn't, we only shared LinkedIn profiles. Um, but but a plant is 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 constrained, and and you set up a plant right, and you optimize a plant that we're talking about in this question plant processes, and you really need to optimize it to what you're building, okay? And and essentially, um, uh, your your manufacturing needs to tie to your design, you know, and and a plant can can produce everything, right? And and so. Essentially, by really honing in on, on, on what, what you're producing and what you're making and, and having a, a heads up and maybe just a, a continuous flow of that same product, you can then optimize your supply chain. Um, you can optimize your DFMA. You know, uh, when I talk about we do Revit and we do, we do a 3D design for our shop drawings and we model every single stud, we model, we model the J-boxes, the light switches, the, you know, the slope on the plumbing pipe. Now, you don't really, it's not as efficient to do that if you're building different product over and over again, right? So if you're a single family, 
then then it does make sense to do that if you're only building one home that way and then you spend all these engineering hours on that and design hours and so um i think in the context of of commercial modular construction we believe uh back to what you asked scott that that you know, uh, improvement in manufacturing will 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 be caused from uh, aided by uh, from design for manufacturing, which is which is really really building um, and 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 modeling exactly what you're going to build, um, and 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 using using BIM and Revit, and and also something else that that I wouldn't really want to answer that in terms of what trends do I see, but maybe what we're doing. Um, I guess that's what I see mostly because I work there full time. Um, uh, we're integrating a lot of software and a lot of people talk about robotics and, and uh, Audrey and Scott, you can stop me. I'm almost done if I take too long, but, but a lot of people just focus so much on like one thing, robotics, you know, and, and what are you using that for? Okay. Wall, wall framing, you know, it's like, that's like what percentage of the total scope of everything we do as a factory is that, you know, is that like 1%? Is that 2%? It's not more. Right. I mean, what about logistics? What about the, the infrastructure and the, the system behind that? What about inventory? Right. Real time inventory. What about all of these things that no one really, you know, cost cost expense allocation? You know, not all factories out there know exactly how much money they're spending per each module that rolls off the line. So everybody's so, so hot on those those keywords. Well, like robots, you, you got to they, they, they call it's like, hey, I want you to build this, but only if you have robots, you know, it's like, oh, OK, I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, so I think those are the trends. Um, um, that, that those are the things that I, I, I think are, are are happening right now, and and um, yeah, uh, it's much more than just robotics or or just a buzzword DFMA. You know, all for a purpose. Absolutely, designing a home in a way where you actually know how it's going to be built. What a concept, right? So that's what we're bringing. <laughs> Let's go with David. What trends do you see in manufacturing design and plant processes for modular? Guys, I, I've been seeing, I've been waiting for this moment uh, for 30 years. And, and even though they're coming to us now out of desperation, <laughs> they're coming to us. And so I, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. We've, uh, because of the trailer house industry, we've, we've been the odd guys out in this, in this, in this, uh, and field for a long time and and because quite frankly the the lack of quality in product and production the lack of uh trying to you know comes from making trying to make a trailer house be everybody's house and stacking them and and doing everything you can to uh to, to make a square peg fit around hole but the cool thing is is that now we're getting architects and engineers and we're getting designers bringing plans to us and we're saying we're, we're able to say yes we, we we can do this and yes we can do it and the question is 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 when a brand brings me something like this it can we do it is is how productive is it going to be is it going to save that client money how much repetition are you going to have by, by in and in, in your product line and so how much more cost effective can it be after after you duplicate it? and so what we're seeing now is is the young architects, the young engineers that that have come up in and 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 hitting realizing that they can actually make a profit from their designs. They can actually control that process of of construction management and actually be the retail dealer for their very own product as opposed to having a GC man that same product and so it's great for architects it's great for engineers because um they're they're able to now now steer a ship that they they before weren't able to steer they had if they wanted to design, design something cool it had <laughs> had to be stick built or it had to be custom you had to get in that field and so now everybody's thinking outside the box but still staying in the box and so it's really nice a biggest part, I would say, Audrey, everybody, but I would say probably seventy percent of our business for the last two years has been in conversion, converting plans for the hotel industry to from 
stick belt prototypes to modular prototypes. And that goes from, from the commercial world, from multifamily to clear down to the high-end custom homes. I'd say we, we have a whole design team at our, at, at our place here and, and we have it spread out over, our, over multiple states and multiple uh, partners. But what we're doing now more than anything is, is, is being um, a, a service that converts these plans for these hotels. We do all for Radisson, uh, for Wyndham, for um, Hilton. We, we get lots and lots of developers and hoteliers plans and we convert them. Uh, we show them how to, uh, we do value engineering and show them how to save money, how to get the process done and, and how to, how to, uh, how to actually get a project done that's, that's uh, within budget and, and within controls of a time frame. Because everything today is in the building world. It's not, it's not, a, it's not so much can you do it, it's, it's how much, how quickly can you do it and how much interest can you save on the construction loan getting from the construction loan to firm financing. And that's, that's a big thing. And, and that's what banks are scared of. So the banks, banks are coming to us, architects are coming to us. And so it's a, it's a nice time to be in this business that we can enjoy the, the, the year that everybody coming to us now, as opposed to everybody walking away from us before. Thank you, David. And now Charlie, um, with Bain West Mad Dash to have your factory open up here soon. What trends are you seeing in manufacturer design and plant processes? You know, across the industry, you see different people hitting different niches of this massive crisis in construction. I think um, Anthony said it, uh, construction kind of sucks. And I'm just quoting Anthony. So if you're in construction, um, be mad at him. But it is, it's, it's a, it does feel like each of these segments of the market need solutions. I mean, you know, the piece that Fading West is really focused on is the attainable entry level um, housing that's still you know high quality and architecturally interesting and we think about all of those together and so what you know the trends that we're seeing are um, when you go off site is the the dfma design for manufacturability but we talk a lot about um, radical reduction of site work is how do we eliminate the everything that happens at the site because that's I don't know what the percentage is, but it is at least twice as expensive to do something at the site as it is to do it in the uh, factory. So we look at uh, bringing all of those things in-house. We look at um, pretty radical standardization within our componentry, but then uh, doing it in a way that still adds uh, and allows flexibility for what the market is demanding. And so how do you create that standardization? Um, but then also create that with flexibility as well. Um, lots of trends that we're seeing is BIM, Revit, um, using software um, to eliminate a lot of these wastes that you see in the design. Um, you see a lot of um, this automation thing too is, is trendy with a lot of different factories. Um, I don't believe in automation until the system is designed well and then it's working and then you can use automation to speed that process but it's never a silver bullet and i think you see a lot of people betting on that and it's, it's it just doesn't work so um yeah lots of different trends i also just sent out in the chat the mckinsey report that came out um, last summer i don't know if all of y'all are familiar with that but really they talk a ton about this idea of the entire value stream be, needing to be analyzed from the beginning of project and development all the way through customers moving in. And they do a great job of quantifying these huge segments of the value stream and how that needs to change and how that needs to be improved and, and, and kind of what are the long-term trends in construction that are that's forcing um, builders and developers to look offsite because they're, they're losing people, they're losing trades, and it's just getting more and more expensive. Materials are getting more expensive. You can always optimate, um, optimize material usage in a factory way better than you can in a remote location. So a lot of these trends, I think, are, are really throughout the industry, but they're driving this need for a new solution. And it's a great place to be. Um, and, and David said it well, it's, it's a good time to be um, providing an option for people who are really struggling to get their projects done. That's awesome, Charlie. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to try to answer this one quickly because I do want to leave a few minutes for questions and answers at the end. 
Um, how is your factory working towards sustainability in your builds and building practices? We're gonna open up with you, David, first. Okay, so um, we're, we started out with a plan to, uh, to work towards sustainability. And so we started out with, um, I literally, when I started this plan, I wanted to do every single thing different than I, I wanted to take every single hiccup and headache that I had in every plant before. And I wanted to get away from that. That's why I don't have a sales department. That's why I, I don't have marketing. That's what, and so we could then focus on R and D. We can focus on all the things that everybody told me no for a thousand times. We, uh, we ship, we have the only rail ready product. We can ship, uh, units, uh, by rail. We can ship units, um, and with, with uh, breakaway floors in them to do uh, to set slab on grate. We have a solution for that. We can top pick our units. We can literally do things that, that everybody, everybody told me, no, can't be done, won't do it. They won't sign off on it. We build a better, stronger, um, more effective product now than, than, uh, than I ever have been allowed to. And I, and I say allowed to, um, because it's true, I, we weren't allowed to do so many things because the, of the stranglehold that that this industry had on it before. And letting the cat out of the bag, you know, um, we're we're ahead of everybody on a lot of different things here in America, but the modular world is 20 years behind. And uh, so you go to you go to Vietnam, Thailand, all these places are ad, way advanced of what we we are. And so now we're catching up. And uh, so it's, it's nice to see, um, you know, as far as sustainability, um, you know, we are able to capture things that normally you would throw away in the field and keep and use and the little bits of sheetrock that you can use for a fire block and the things that normally would hit the trash can, we're able to keep and, 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 uh, and effectively uh, service our clients by not having to spend that same money twice. So we are... Uh, we're working for some of the things that, that Anthony talked about accountability and, and um, talking about how, how to maximize the, uh, the, the production of the build, Be, being able to tell me why that on the floor that Joe can do this task faster than, than Bill can. So we, we, uh, we've gone well past the, uh, the old paper and clipboard travelers. We, we actually, uh, we actually track the guys, what they're doing every single piece of material that goes into that to that build if it, if we carry a one board to it it gets logged in and so that we can we can do the analytics we can tell who's doing a better job who's better suited for that that particular uh place in in station in the factory so those are the things that we're we're trying to get away from you know the 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 old school uh um factory uh rules and, and regulations and, 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 you know, use iPads and bring things to the, to, to, to this, uh, 20 years ago. <laughs> yes, I love it. To be. I love it. Thank you. Anthony, um, what sustainable options are you using in your builds or building processes or practices? For, for the record, Audrey, I was prepared to answer this one fast to compensate for all of my long answers, but, <laughs> but then you jumped in, you said, go fast. So I'm going to go double fast. So, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, and in order to do that, I'm going to give an example. So I think to answer this question, sustainability, it has to do with standardization, like Charlie and, and, and everybody else talked about. Um, and, and back to what I had said earlier, that might be one of the disadvantages that you need to be very standardized, but it's true. And so when, when we talk about standardization being necessary to achieve sustainability, I'll give you one example, and then I'm going to pass the baton over. Um, our ceiling drywall. We buy it as a four foot wide by 15 foot, three inch uh, piece of drywall from the manufacturer. So uh, we actually, for the first time that we ever got that first truckload in, you need a truckload for, to, to have them uh, cut it to size for you. Uh, we were using uh, four foot by 12 foot, right? And then it took us about two hours to lay that on our ceiling check. And then um, everybody uh, was mad that the truck wasn't wrong. So anyway, the truck arrives. And then it took 20 minutes to lay that because we didn't have all these joints. And so, you know, when we're talking about, you know, sustainability, we're talking about knowing what you're building so you can, you know, so you can actually 
make it more efficient, you know, low, like very low waste, right? We have zero waste on that four foot by 15, uh, three piece of drywall. And so that's kind of the mentality that, that you need, you need to use to achieve sustainability, um, um, in, in, in a, in a modular, in a modular plant. Um, that's my answer. I love it. That's so great. And I love that, you know, you keep evolving in your factory, you keep evolving in your systems, you keep trying new things and, and using things that service you quickly, which is so awesome. Um, Charlie, let's throw it over to you. I would echo exactly what those guys said. Um, you, we, we're able to think about the entire system and we can control our designs and we can get standardization based on our materials, how they're coming in, the sheet sizes, uh, the production and efficiency of our um, systems in the factory. Um, so there's a, it, it, working within a factory gives you just, you know, every option of looking at waste and eliminating it. It's just a much more controlled environment. So I echo what everybody said. Awesome. Michael, do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I'll, I'll, I'll echo the same thing everybody just said. So uh, utilizing, um, you know, software, updated software, Anthony mentioned early on Revit and being able to identify, you know, I have these, you know, four pieces of blocking that I can cut out of a two by eight stud versus, you know, two by 16 or whatever makes sense. But yeah, echoing the same thing everybody just said. I love it. And I love that you guys are continuing to evolve in your process and we're looking at things a little bit differently. Um, really quick, um, we're going to have to answer in like a couple of couple of sentences, but is it possible to have single family and commercial projects in your factory, being able to have two lanes or three lanes or four lanes um, and able to be able to do both projects because they're both specifically different, right? There's a lot of same traits to them, but again, different um, plant-wise to run them. Anthony, are you able to do both single family and commercial in your um, factories? I'll take a hard stance uh, just to make it interesting so people disagree with me. Um, I'll say no. Um, sure, you can do whatever you want. I mean, you can you can stand up now, dance around. You can do whatever you want, but um, uh, commercial projects are different than, than single family. And actually, I'm, I'm really looking forward to David's answer because I think he might be doing that. Um, all my experience leads me to say no but I would uh, be curious to learn and see if I'm missing anything. David, why don't you take that? Well, uh, the answer is yes, if you have Audrey as a client, because um, you have no choice. But, um, it's, uh, but yeah, I, 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 can, I used to be able to say no and would have adamantly agree. Um, I could tell you that it's not, it's something that needs to happen in a dedicated line for single families. So if you can divide your plant, if you have the, the, the blessing and the benefit of the square footage to be able to, uh, to do that, then, then you, yes, you can effectively pull that off. Um, my best employee is, is, is the guy that works at Subway. If he can read that deal that says, put three pieces of meat here and two pieces of cheese and one slice of mayonnaise, I, I, I can teach him how to build a house. And so that's, uh, that, that's what we do. We break it down at the station. And that all comes from the Revit and, the, and, the, and all the different tools that we have at our disposal now that, that we haven't had before. So, so yes, it's possible. Um, I would definitely never do it in the same line, but in the same building, yeah, absolutely. Charlie, how about you? Uh, then you're cheating. I'll just say that, David. <laughs> yeah. Um, the way we're looking at it is we're, we're really focusing on, on residential and smaller footprint um, timber frame apartments. And so we're not getting into hotels. We're still doing, going to do IBC through our through the same line, but really limiting the apartment. It does create a lot of headaches. Mostly it is there are different systems and different materials and different codes, obviously. Um, the biggest thing for us is it clogs our single line for for just too long so that's a big challenge but um i think it, i think it's possible if you constrain what you're doing on the com on the um, commercial side to to a pretty easy niche in that market 
Well, I love that you all know what your market is, and I love that you all know what your capacities are. Michael, you know, you have your factory in South Dakota. Now you're looking at the Southwest to build the next one. Um, what's your plan for that? Are you going to be able to do both? Uh, we are looking at doing both, um, but we will have a separate line that kind of specializes in the one-off single family or the smaller ADU type processes. Otherwise, you know, these guys mentioned you got to have, you know, a lot of product going through there. We're doing it in our current factory, but we have 18 single family houses that are very similar. Um, and so we'll push those through each house has three different boxes and we're pushing those through quickly. Um, and those are taking up, you know, a schedule and then we'll have the next commercial project follow behind that. So, but doing a one-off is very, very difficult and can screw up your schedule. Thank you. So we have one last question we'll ask really quick here, and then we have one audience question to get to as well. Um, so this final question is, you know, we're taking it out of the factory now and going to the site. So how do you feel construction is going to evolve for the site work set and stitch and general contractor roles as we move more into modular? And uh, Charlie, let's start with you. I think the integration between the general contractor and the factory is, is probably the biggest opportunity to improve the, the success of these projects. It's, um, it's why we have a general contracting division and why we have a factory and why we, you know, we're the end customer to a lot of our products. And so, you know, how construction is going to evolve on the site, I think is for the people who are trying to make this a part of their business model, it's, it's how, does, how does everything at the site interact with the designs and what is being fabricated. So the contractors' roles, I think that, again, long-term trends, they're going to be struggling for resources and manpower, and we want to help optimize the, the skills and the resources that they have so they can do more projects and, and, and obviously to, to, um, to create more supply in the market, and that's what we think about a lot. Nice. Michael, how about you? You know, I kind of hinted on this earlier, but yeah, thinking about uh, the GC being involved early on with the designer, with the factory, uh, we're building our own 42 plex apartment building here that we've developed, we designed, we built in our factory and we have our own GC doing it. And we learned a lot from that process um, on all the different roles and what the needs are and being able to communicate with your GC procurement guy to your superintendent and letting them get involved early on in the design and really think through that whole process. I think it's just gonna uh, keep getting stronger and stronger as people dive into this modular world. David? Well, I think that, that we're already seeing a convergence of, of set crews and, and GCs. I think it's already begun. I think uh, a lot of people, um, you know, they, once they, they realize that they watch a few of these sets and they see that our method of construction and, and the ease of the sets now compared to what it, it was a lot more specialized at a time. I think these general contractors are realizing that if they don't adapt, if they don't learn to have these sectors within, then they're they're going to be consumed by the setters that turn that turn into GCs because that's almost every set company that's that's uh, worth its weight is also doing GC now, and uh, they're 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 taking the market via the modular industry, and so so the the big boys have all taken notice. They're they're stepping up and. And uh, the, the convergence is here. It's there, there, it's, uh, that, that's where I see the biggest evolution for that, that, that question. And Anthony. Yeah, and I'll, I'll tap into what David said and, and go actually uh, a little more high level than that. Um, so I have said in the past that before I die, modular is going to be 50% uh, of the market. And I could be wrong but let's assume for the sake of this argument that I'm right. Um, and uh, essentially, I think that um, um, we all need to educate um, what modular is. It's not something cheap, it's not trailers, right? And the value add that we've been discussing here. And I think that your developers, at least our experience is the developers are more of early adopters than the GCs because GCs are like, oh, you're gonna take all my scope, you're gonna take all my scope. So. Uh, in any case, I think when developers, uh, I think developers are going to be the first ones who are kind of going to adapt and they really see the value add. And then the faster those GCs kind of adapt to that and say, okay, 
that's the new reality, right? So it kind of reminds me of COVID where you're in denial and then it's like, okay, my world is shattered. Like nothing around me is the same. And it's the fact, like, even if it didn't touch me as much, it's touched everybody I know. And so if modular is successful, uh, I kind of envision GCs kind of looking at each other and saying that. And then uh, kind of like Charlie mentioned, that value add component of modular, that's not all, all factories want to do, right? If you're a factory, it's totally different than being a GC on, on site, right? So it's so much opportunity and value there. And and the, the, the sooner GCs jump into that and take advantage of it and, and kind of get past the denial stage, uh, the better it's going to be not only for them and their, their, their books, but it's going to be better for everybody. Indeed it is. Uh, and we just had someone ask in the chat about where to watch this afterwards. Just another note, you can go on offsitedirt.com where this will be available. Um, and, and to close it out here, we're now going to move into the audience questions. We'll just go a few minutes over just to, um, we had one really good audience question. So gentlemen, whichever one of you this question calls to, uh, feel free to answer. We have a question from Benson. And if that is uh, Ted Benson, sir, we love your content on the construction industry as well. Um, he asked, what are the challenges you faced as an offsite construction manufacturer? Any difficulty in complying with local or state national building regulations or securing projects when competing with conventional construction? And did you have any thoughts on that? Any one of you guys can jump in. I, I can answer that. It's, it's been an education process. It's been something that we've had to actually go to planning and zoning meetings. We've had to go to the building departments. We've had to hold their hand. We've had to walk them through to the point where the light bulb went off and they say, well, this is, this is just as good. This is actually better. And, and, and so when they, when they see that, 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 you know, the, everything from sheer to, 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 to everything all the way down through, we, we have to build these things to go down the highway. And so uh, not only that, we have to build them, be able to pick up four stories in the air over the top of a tree or whatever, over the top of something and, and even set upon themselves. Uh, you know, we've, we've had to hold the hand of a, a building inspector that's been sitting in his, his chair for 35 years going, this is the way we're going to do it. We're not going to do it any other way. And, and to them realizing it's a lot less work for them to, 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 to do this process. So, so I think it's, it's, um, when, when they see, when they come in and they see a better product hit the ground and with five employees that, that made that happen, as opposed to, you know, their 50 employees that took to do it before, you know, run that construction company. I think that, that it opens the eyes of, of those, uh, of a lot of people. And it's, it's been a snowball. It's been a fun ride for the last uh, you know, I expected to, to, to weather up and die during COVID, but we've, we just got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's great. Thank you. That's a great, great response to that. Um, is there any other questions that you're seeing, Scott? Nope. That was, that was the one we got. All right, great. So um, let's put up our closing slide and um, thank you, um, Anthony, Charlie, Michael, and David, um, I can't thank you enough for your participation today. I think your insight, um, I think what you're doing is changing our world in construction. I love that we are creating a community where we can have these conversations and educate people. Obviously, all the people that are on um, the panel today can be reached through LinkedIn. This will be um, covered on offsitedirt.com. I'll also be putting it on our channels through LinkedIn as well, um, but please, keep the conversations going. If you do have projects and you're considering, we have different areas of the country that we can now service and help. Um, we can provide any type of assistance or questions. I'm always available. My name is Audrey Grabesic. I have Scott Hickens here as well. Thank you for joining us today on the Offsite Construction Series. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you everyone. Have an awesome day. Thank you. Thank you everyone.